Yeah, thanks. Um, I will come to this talk. Um, you heard about me, so I work for KDAP. Uh, we do Qt, OpenGL, and C++. And with that, um, let's dive right in. Um, so this talk uh, first um, will define uh, partially formed um, as we use it in this talk. Uh, then we will go on discuss uh, some examples of partially formed objects um, as early as C and C++ 98 um, in elements of programming, the Stepanov book on which this is based. Um, then we talk about move semantics in C++ 11, uh, in particular about the indirect int that you have maybe seen in Herb Sutter's move simply um, blog post and about flat map. And then we will talk, uh, take a look at uh, C++20, where we'll look at the movable concept and how that changes things. Um, we will briefly re revisit uh, Abraham's uh, exception guarantees and in general present collected wisdom and guidelines for class authors and users alike. About me, I'm a defecting member of the Church of Emacs. I'm an inspiring member of the Temple of uh, Elements of Programming. And at KDAP, I'm the guardian of the partially formed state. So here's the rundown of uh, what we will um, talk about. And uh, first of all, we'll talk about what partially, partially formed states are, where they come from, and where they pro uh, crop up. So this is the book uh, which defined the term. Um, it's Elements of Programming uh, by Alexander Stepanov, the author of the STL, and Paul McJones, a contributor um, of his. And um, uh, that book is a math book because Alex thinks that uh, programming is a sub uh, discipline of mathematics. So this book is full uh, like a linear algebra book with lemmas and proofs and whatnot. Uh, but very early on, uh, it defines um, the partially formed state as an object is in the partially formed state if it can be assigned to and destroyed. It's pretty simple. So let's uh, have a look at the various forms uh, th that this can take. So int i semicolon. You can assign to it. You must assign to it before you use it further because it's uninitialized. And Stepanov calls this partially formed because you can destroy it. It's perfectly OK to def define this um, int on, on the stack and then do something else and never use it um, like an old C style functions where everything was declared at the top and then just run out of function and never touch the variable. That's perfectly fine. So you can destroy it and you can assign it and you must assign to it before uh, you can do something useful with it. Um, so an object is a partially formed state if it can be assigned to and destroyed. So here we have the same thing, but we initialize it with a zero. The question is, is I still partially formed? And the answer is yes, because the object is in a partially formed state if it can be assigned to and destroyed. And obviously, this int uh, can be destroyed and it can be assigned to. And this is actually a lemma in, um, in uh, elements of programming, lemma 1.4, a well-formed object is partially formed. Um, so clearly, every object is partially formed when it is uh, assignable and destructible. But this is um, sometimes this is used as a straw man to say partially formed does not mean anything because every well formed object is, is, is also partially formed. So you don't gain anything uh, by talking about partially formedness. So in this talk, I have tried to make uh, the distinction between capitalized partially formed, that means known to be partially formed, but not known to be well formed. Um, so you know that you can assign to it and you can destroy it but you don't know whether you can do more. And that's the capitalized version of partially formed state. So with this, this int is partially formed, lowercase, but not partially formed, uppercase, because we know ints. We don't need to look at the documentation. We know that we can add 15 to it, and therefore we know that it's well formed. Yeah, the same is true for standard string. A default constructed standard string, if you are not completely new to C++, you will know that it's an empty string. And uh, as such, um, and as many com container classes, um, a default constructed container class should be empty. So it should not be partially formed, um, uh, but it should be well formed and empty because that is a natural state for, for a container class to be in. 
If I give you an, a type that you don't know, some rect here, R, then R here is partially formed capital because it might be well formed. If this rect is Q rect, then this is well formed because the default constructor initializes the members. If it's just a struct of int x, y, width, and height, um, a pod, a C compatible struct, uh, then this is partially formed um, because uh, the individual members are uninitialized and you need to assign something before you can use it. So this brings us to the first guideline, and this is the most important guideline. Unless you know that a class in question provides more, all you can assume is that a default constructed object is partially formed. Yeah, this is comes straight from EOP. And um, this is um, basically the most important guideline. There will be another one for moved from objects, um, but uh, for now, this is uh, the most important to remember. Guideline two, a partially formedness is a program state and not a bit pattern. You might say, huh? Um, but uh, let me show you an example here. Um, we have an int which we uh, allocate on the heap and we initialize it with zero. And then we delete. And the pointer p after delete is, what can we do with it? We can assign to it and we can destroy it. We are not allowed to read it, technically speaking. So that thing is partially formed because a partially formed object you can assign to and destroy. And actually we know that it's not well formed. Okay, so um, this, you can do the same with malloc and, and free. So this is something where partially formedness already comes uh, in, in C. This is nothing new. It has been there under different form, under different um, names um, in, in the standards of C, Kerning and Rixi standard and C++ 98. Um, but uh, the good thing about um, um, Alex Stepanov's uh, book is that it gives a name to all of these states um, that were called uninitialized or, or invalid or deleted. Yeah. So um, here, what is noteworthy is that we go from line th two to line three and the bit pattern of P has not changed. Yet on line two, before we execute the delete, P is a perfectly valid pointer. Otherwise we are not allowed to call delete on it. But in line three, the same variable with the same content is now partially formed and not well formed. I'm not allowed to do anything with that. And it gets worse. If we take a copy of the pointer before we delete the pointer, both the copy and the original object pointer object um, immediately zap into a partially formed, not well formed, if the if the pointee is deleted through any of those pointers. Yeah. So try to do that across threads. That's fun. Another thing where this comes up, very similar, is um, if I have a file star taken from open and I close it. And suddenly F star is partially formed, not well formed. Yeah. So uh, in all these cases, all we can do with the object is assign a new value from open, from new, or destroy the object, the pointer. So the objects are partially formed. There's yet another example from C++ 98, input iterators. If you have an input iterator that is not also a forward iterator or some higher category, and you take a copy of it and you advance the original, what happens? Yeah, you guessed it. Um, all you can do is assign to it and delete it. Uh, for sure, you cannot read through it anymore. So JT here is partially formed, not well formed. IT not, because you have advanced it. That's the iterator that you advance. But the old copies that have not been advanced they are magically partially formed. Okay. One thing that is important here is that um, while the value does not change between partially formed and well-formed states, these two states don't, co don't coincide in time. So there's always a time where it's valid and then there's a time where it's not valid. This is important to remember. So um, 
we will later talk about um, what the standard has to say about this. And you might have heard about the valid but unspecified state. And um, one problem with that definition is that it's not composable. And what do I mean with this is this. So partially formed objects compose. You have a struct pair, start vector vec and int idx, and that index is an index into the vector. Yeah. So if I default construct this, it is partially formed. The vector is empty, so there cannot be an index into the vector, yet the object exists. And um, you can say it has not established its um, its invariance. You can say uh, this should have been a class where the constructor um, constructor um, uh, um, main establishes the, the class invariance. You can say that the int should not be an int, but an optional int. All this is true, but the fact is that we write these classes and they are the most simple way, aggregates are the most simple way to define types in C++. And they should work. They are more or less the most native of types uh, that you can write in the language. Um, if, at least if you come from a C black background and they should work and this type does work it's perfectly okay you can copy it you can even move from it everything works perfectly fine as long as you have a valid object it stays valid that way and about the ways in which it can become invalid or partially formed as i like to say we'll talk um I want to pay a bit of tribute to elements of programming, so I could not uh, have this talk without at least a lemma in it. So um, <clears throat> let's prove what we just said. Um, let n be greater than one and um, n types um, be semi-regular. That means you can uh, copy them and um, um, they behave um, as normal types, but they are not necessarily equ uh, equality comparable. So let s be a struct of these types and um, small s be a member of the domain of s. And then um, for if for all the i's, uh, the ti's are partially formed, then it follows, actually it's equivalent, um, that s is partially formed. So proof, um, this is trivial by way of member-wise assignment and destruction. So if s, small s, is assigned assignable to, then of course the members are assignable to, because that is how the compiler implements it. If one of the members was not assignable to, then S would not have been assignable to. So proof by contradiction. The same goes for destruction. And, at the, and likewise, if you have that all the types in the struct are assignable to, then you can assign the struct as a whole and ditto for the destruction. So it's really clear and trivial to see that this is the that is the case that um, partially formed objects compose into larger objects and those larger objects become partially formed themselves. And crucially, this is not true for valid but unspecified. Valid but unspecified does not compose and we will later see um, proof, basically a flat map. Uh, we'll talk about that on the slide 42. So first chapter, summary, be precise. Yeah, if you talk about the partially formed state, uh, be precise in what you mean. Um, partially formed means it's destructible and assignable, and that includes well-formed, and that is not quite useful. What you usually want to uh, say when you say partially formed is either partially formed not known to be well-formed, because you don't know the type, that rectangle that we had, or partially formed known not to be well-formed, like a default constructed int, for example. Yeah. So we have seen that partially formed objects exist in the language as early as Kerning and Ricci C, int i semicolon, and C++ 98, input iterators, new, delete. Default initialized objects are partially formed, invalid pointers, copies of input iterators since advanced, file handles that have been closed. Guidelines that we've seen so far, unless you know that the class in question provides more, all that you can assume is that the default constructed object, a default constructed object is partially formed, capitalized. You don't know. You would need to read the class documentation to find out what the default constructor does. But if you're too lazy, like we all are, and don't read the documentation, then 
you can always assume that a default constructed object is partially formed. This is the beauty of this state is that it works for all the types. You don't need to know what a standard string, a standard vector or a QRect or a QPen or a boost, whatever uh, optional uh, has as a default constructor. Um, you can always assume that it's partially formed and your code will always be correct. Partially formed is a program state, not a bit pattern. And a composition of partially formed state is partially formed. And with this, I ask whether there are any questions before I go to the next topic. Um, there are no questions so far. OK. So next topic, move semantics. This is really where elements of programming and the partially formed state um, struck a chord with me. Uh, when I started to add uh, move semantics to Qt um, um, post Qt 5, um, there were a lot of classes where it's not easy or not cheap uh, to guarantee a valid state of a moved from object. And we'll see at the very end, we'll see one of those classes where this is almost impossible to do. And so I I found for me as a solution to just um, make them invalid. And only later I made the connection with uh, with partially formed state um, and, and the EOP book. And um, I wrote a paper, not paper, blog post in 2017 or so. So for me, this is not very new. Um, I've been pondering this stuff um, for quite some time now, and um, all that buzz that came about with Geoffrey Romer's paper and then Herb's blog post that you may know, uh, this is all old news for me. Um, um, so this is the class that Geoffrey Romer used in his paper. Uh, to get the discussion going whether uh, this uh, valid but unspecified is correct as written in the standard. And um, Herb Sutter in his move simply um, talk, um, or I don't know whether he just given a talk about it, but a blog post um, has also used it. So this is a very simple class um, written in C++ 98 times, yeah, where um, we have a shared pointer to int. And the class invariant, as documented, is that mi is never null. And in C++ 98, that cannot happen because the constructor always uh, uses make shared to create an, an, a valid object. The copy constructor does not uh, um, makes a copy of the shared pointer, and so that can never be null. And um, the copy assignment operator too. So. Um, in C++ 98, it was perfectly okay to write the uh, um, equality operator, assuming that mi is never null. So you can just in unconditionally dereference it in the implementation. Likewise, if you want to stream it out, um, you don't need to do anything. You just, no checks, you just um, dereference the mi. But if you compile this <clears throat> with a C++ 11 compiler and a boost library, which has been move enabled, Suddenly, because you were using the rule of zero, you get move semantics for free. And um, a moved from shared pointer is null. So a moved from indirect int suddenly no longer um, adheres to the class invariant, which says mi is never null. And the question is, is this a problem or not? And Herb um, maintains, um, at least at the time of writing, I don't know whether he changed his mind, um, in this move simply, uh, he said, move is just an optimization of a copy, so this class is broken. And no, it's not. And to see why it's not broken, because um, but completely OK as written, we need to go uh, back in time 18 years and look at the original paper uh, that introduced move semantics. And there were tries to implement move semantics uh, in library terms with a move t class um, tag type that you can wrap around types, and then there would be a move constructor which takes a move t of uh, of of t uh, and stuff like that. And one of the reasons why this did not fly and why this was made into a language feature is 
in the paper itself, where it says a pure library implementation of move semantics did not automatically move from R, value, R values, which is a really nice feature of the current proposal, the one that adds it to the language. This allows, and I quote, completely safe move semantics to come into a client code with absolutely no changes for the client, no code changes for the client. Yeah. So it's totally safe with absolutely no changes to the, for the client. And this is exactly one of those classes where it is perfectly okay. Um, if you don't do any changes, uh, you don't need to delete the um, move constructors, nothing. This is perfectly okay if, if you treat moved from objects as partially formed and only then. So in order to fulfill the original goal of move semantics, you need to embrace partially formed objects as moved from state of objects. It's as simple as that. Whether you like it or not, that is the truth. It sits there like a platonic ideal, um, the partially formed state in C and C++ languages. It's there whether you like it or not. Next example, <clears throat> standard remove, standard remove if, standard unique. Um, so another um, problem um, that was that was uh, given in, in that um, paper is if you have a vector of indirect int and you stood remove from v begin to v end all the indirect ints which compare equal to zero. Then in C++ 98, uh, it would swap around all the stuff so that um, the to be removed elements are at the end of the um, Sorry, uh, at the end of the container. Um, they are not removed from the container because standard remove um, is an algorithm. It only works on iterators and it does not know how to erase elements from the container. Um, so in C++ 98, you could theoretically, well, not with that loop, but uh, you could um, loop over the whole vector after standard remove and print all the elements out and you would see some rubbish at the end. Um, already in C++ 98, this was bad code because if you look at effective STL, you see that um, treat objects uh, that are in between the return element of uh, return return value of standard remove and the end of the, uh, of the container as partially formed. And um, the guidance was to use the erase and remove idiom instead. Of course, this was not phrased quite like that because elements of programming has not been released yet. Um, so you can see it's um, random or whatever you used, um, but in fact, it's partially formed. And in C++ 98, standard remove no longer swaps around the elements uh, to get those which it wants to remove to the end of the container, but it moves. Yeah? So it maintains two iterators and um, one where the end of the, of the um, valid range is, and then the next where it moves um, stuff from. And um, so in the end, uh, if standard remove returns um, the ret from the return value of standard move to the end, you have moved from objects in C++11. So how to fix this example already in C++98, you were supposed to use the remove, uh, erase remove idiom. Yeah. Uh, so don't even look at the return value of uh, standard remove, um, but pass it directly to the vector erase, um, passing the vector end at, as the second argument, and it would remove all the actually scheduled for removal um, items. And then, of course, you can iterate over the whole vector because the vector only contains those items that um, you did not want in the container and not that rubbish that standard remove left at the end. Okay, so this is the way to fix this for C++ 98 and 11, and that works. In C++ 20, we now got um, the standard erase. Um, this is rubbish. Um, standard erase of V and indirect int. Uh, is correct, the standard remove needs to be removed. Um, but this um, is the this is a uniform container erasure, I think it's called. Um, it's new in C20. And um, that actually uh, encodes um, what was written here with the erase remove idiom. And um, while with the erase, erase remove idiom, between the return from remove and um, the actual erasing from the vector, you have a part of the vector in a partially formed state. 
Um, with the new function, this does not happen because uh, this state is completely encapsulated in the, in the function. Uh, you don't get to see uh, partially formed objects this way. My conjecture is that the remove-like algorithms, that is remove, remove if, and unique as the standard algorithms, not as member functions of, of um, list, for example, are the only known cases where moved from objects appear in a program that was written in C++ 98, recompiled under C++ 11 plus compiler without an explicit standard move. And this was the goal to make it safe for, um, for the compiler to inject moves into an otherwise C++ 98 um, program when uh, recompiling in C++ 11. That was the raison d'etre to make it um, to make it into a library feature, uh, to make it into a language feature and not a library feature. If you know any other functions that produce move from objects as part of the normal operation um, that didn't do so in uh, C++ 98, please let me know. I will maintain this list because um, we need to remove them, not remove them, but replace them, um, overload them, give something else. Because um, as Sean Parent is um, want to say, a standard move is an unsafe operation and not unsafe in the sense uh, that the Microsoft compiler does not let you use um, printf um, or the three argument form of standard copy um, or standard equal, but unsafe in that it breaks the type system. Uh, because partially formed states, um, if you, think about it a bit deeper, um, they break invariants of classes. So they, they break um, the states of classes, therefore the states of, of programs. So in this case, in a sense, they are unsafe. And remove if um, and uh, remove and unique are in the same pattern, in the same category. If you just can't tolerate the thought of partially formed objects, because that that notion is so far away from from your daily life, then there's a solution. Don't use unsafe uh, unsafe functions. And the the good thing here is that there are only a handful of these. So there's standard move. Um, you need to use it if you want to implement the move assignment constructor, uh, move assignment operator. But in all other cases, you can get away with using standard exchange instead. Um, standard exchange with the default constructed object. Uh, because the standard exchange uh, function, uh, like the standard erase function, encapsulates the moment in which the partially formed state appears. It uses standard move internally. Uh, but uh, you don't get to see the, the resulting state because it's overwritten by the second argument of standard exchange before the function returns. So in this case, it's the safe, uh, so in this sense, it's the safe um, version of standard move. And the same for erase if uh, with remove if. Um, what you can see here is that we're missing one for standard unique. And there's no erase unique. Um, so that is one unsafe function that um, we don't have a safe replacement for yet. Next example, flat map. Flat map as uh, currently um, specified um, has separate stores for the keys and the values. Um, the reason for this is um, that um, if the keys and the values have different alignments or different sizes, you don't waste space. And if you if you go through the list of keys uh, with, a, with a binary search, um, then you have a higher effective cache size because you only iterate over the keys and not the values are not interspersed with the keys. Uh, so you get more keys per cache line and therefore you have a higher cache bandwidth um, that way. And then when you have found the key, then you can index back into the uh, into the M values container. So what happens here if um, if I move from a flat map, right? Remember partially formed states compose. So if I move from a flat map, the flat map is in partially formed state if the corresponding um, keys and values containers are, which we can assume. So assuming that um, K and V are such that the move from state is partially formed, then we know that a flat map composed of those is partially formed. 
If we take the standard definition of moved from, valid but unspecified, this is no longer true. Uh, moved from flat map cannot be valid but unspecified without extra work. Why? Uh, one of the invariants of flat map is that the number of keys is the same as the number of values. Uh, even if you allow duplicates and stuff, there's always a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between the elements in M keys and the elements in M values. So assuming you have one container um, that is um, when moved from is valid but unspecified and it chooses just to stay the same. Yeah. Like standard string, for example, um, a valid implementation is uh, if, if the string is in its SSO state, if it does not have a heap allocation but uh, stores the string internally because it's short enough, then move is a copy because the write back to a uh, um, to the source object would be more work setting its size to zero than just leaving it as it is. And the other one is a standard vector, um, normal standard vector, which of course, when you move away from it, unless you have a very weird allocator, um, is empty. So now you move away from that flat map from car to, to whatever the vector contains. And um, the M keys variable has not changed the size and M values is zero. Now the invariant of flat map that um, keys and values have the same size or the same elements um, is broken. And you can say, okay, I can take the minimum of those two, but technically you would probably pick, if you asked for the size of the flat map, you would probably ask, uh, ask the keys or the values and not both and take the minimum. That's something that nobody would do. Uh, if you have an invariant that says that the uh, number of keys and the number of values are the same, then you can just pick one of them. And then the answer becomes wrong if you pick um, the one with with more elements, because then you try to index um, into the 15th element and um, the value for that does not exist. So um, this is the proof that um, valid but unspecified does not compose. Flat map is the proof for this. Uh, and the problem does not exist if you assume that a move from object is not valid, but um, that it is partially formed. Because for that, we have proven that it's OK. That's the, if the element types are uh, partially formed, then so is the struct uh, constructed from them. So move semantic summary. Valid C++ pro, uh, 98 programs become invalid C++ 11 ones unless you treat moved from objects as partially formed. Guidelines that we have seen, treat moved from objects as partially formed. Treat objects in the range um, uh, as returned from standard remove to the end as partially formed, use the erase, erase, erase remove idiom. Standard move is an unsafe operation and so are standard remove, standard remove if and standard unique. And if you can't tolerate the thought of uh, moved from object, uh, from partially formed objects, then don't create them. Um, always initialize your ints, um, always initialize um, your, your structs, um, your aggregates directly and use um, standard um, erase if instead of standard remove if and standard exchange instead of standard move. Yeah, questions so far? Yes, there's a couple of questions. Um, I start in reverse order because then you have to move less slides. Um, mm -hmm. Let's start with 42. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, this is not the same as boost flat map, but a concept conceptual flat map, right? This is, uh, I don't know how fl boost flat map does it, but this is the flat map that is uh, proposed for standardization. Uh, within the standardization process, it was asked that uh, the key and the value containers be split. So this is a container mostly for performance optimizations, right? Like a uh, map. Right. Yeah. You don't want um, you don't want to heap allocate every node. So um, this is a way to use vectors for keys and values and um, have only two allocations uh, for the whole thing instead of uh, O n. Mm -hmm. um, the next question was from slide uh, thirty. The person asked um, if you can. Um, Give some more information on the last guideline. Can I elaborate on it, please? 
composition of partially formed objects is partially formed. That one. Mm -hmm. I have to assume, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, um, what, what we have seen here is that if you have, um, let's let's say moved from, yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, back when we were talking about this slide, I said uh, this is uh, if if the elements are partially formed, so is the uh, is the struct made from them. So we know that index, uh, the int index, is uh, is one where the default constructor state is partially formed. And I also mentioned that uh, a standard vector, uh, when it is uh, default constructed, is empty. So there cannot be an index int index into the vector that is a valid index into an empty vector. So in this sense, if we assume that um, somehow the class invariant of this not quite class is that the index is an index into the vector, a default constructed pair here uh, is not valid because there cannot be such an index into the vector. You would need to make the index um, an optional of int, for example, and then the default constructed optional of int, of course, is a non-existing int, and that would correspond to an empty vector. But if you have uh, structs like this, um, partially formed works pretty well because you can default construct these things and um, they don't represent the value. And only when you assign something valid to it, then the object becomes well formed. And um, you can assign to it, that's clear. You can um, destroy it, that's also clear. We have even proven it here um, that this is the case on this slide. And this is the nice thing about partially formed object. One of the problems with locks, for example, lock-based programming, is that locks don't compose, right? And um, what we do every day in software is we take components and we compose them into something larger. And so if something is composable, that helps us very much. And if something is not composable, that does not help us. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, um, partially formedness uh, is um, very nice as a concept because it applies to every object in the world and uh, it composes. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, thank you, that, that helps. Um, maybe a question for myself. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned this difference between erasive and removive. Mm -hmm. um, how does calling removeIf expose you to this um, to this pitfalls of use of, of move semantics? I have a notion of it, but I'm not entirely sure I understand it correctly. So standard remove, standard remove if, and standard um, unique um, as, as SDL algorithms work on a pair of iterators. So they cannot actually remove elements uh, that they schedule for removal from the container. Okay, so far? So uh, mm -hmm. before and after the standard erase uh, or a standard remove um, call, the size of the container is the same. Yeah, standard remove just uh, it's basically a partition. Right, everything that I want to keep, I put in the front of the vector, and everything that I want to kick out, I put in the end. But it's not partition in that it uh, does not preserve the values of those elements uh, that it wants to throw away which partition does. Uh, but uh, it's an optimization of partition because we don't want to deal with the objects that we want to remove anymore. Uh, so we can just move from them. We don't need to swap into them. We don't need to sort. We don't need to run a quick sort loop um, to, to, to uh, maintain. So we move from somewhere far in the back, for example, to somewhere in the front? So uh, how this is implemented is that uh, you go linearly through the, through the uh, vector. And um, if you find an element that you want to remove, you remember that. And then if you find the next element that you don't want to remove, you move it on top of mm -hmm. the element that you wanted to remove, right? And so you keep these two iterators and you go through the container. And at the end, if you reach the end with one of them, uh, the, the lagging one um, uh, shows you the first element that you would assign move assigned to if you had another element not to remove. And then the other one is, of course, the end of the container because you have reached the end. And this range, therefore, only consists of moved from objects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then uh, the iterator to the first moved from object is what standard remove returns. And in C++ 98, that was not a problem because there was no move. It used swap. And instead of moving from, from uh, the, the 
to keep elements to the uh, to the end of the of the valid range, it swapped them, uh, okay. and that preserves the value, of course. Um, it's a bit slower. Um, we all know that swap is three moves, um, and uh, so. Uh, but uh, as as a side effect of this algorithm, uh, at the end of the of the algorithm run, you had uh, the tail of valid objects, and now you have moved from objects. This is the difference. And if you compare this to, can you go to this a bit forward to the slide where you show standard in the C plus plus twenty version, the C plus plus standard arrays, um, and inside of it you have standard uh, remove. Go a bit further. So, so this is um, how uh, Scott Myers in 1996 or so in effective STL told you how to deal with this is um, you should not depend on the state of uh, the elements uh, that uh, standard remove has scheduled for removal, but you should immediately um, give that iterator to the container erase algorithm, which actually can dispose of them physically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is the remove erase idiom. You call mm -hmm. remove that sorts out those elements that you want to keep from those that you want to throw away, returns you the first element to throw away that you pass into the range erase of, uh, of any container uh, together with the end. And that makes sure that it takes um, all these elements, unwanted elements, and removes them physically from the container. Um, and this pattern, these two functions, container erase plus standard remove, they are now uh, together, put together into uh, standard erase. Let me. But this is I, it, this still looks like you're calling two functions. So like yeah, I'm, I, 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 I said it's, well. it's wrong. I, I'm fixing the slide. Second. Oh, okay. So this this was where some of my mental <laughs> model broke apart. I just now need to hope that the thing does not crash. Ha. Huh. Yeah. So oh, okay. Now that makes a lot more yeah. sense. Now okay. Can. Yeah. Because now you're not exposed to the state anymore. Yeah. All right. right. Exactly. So because this function does both. Yeah. Um, and therefore, it needs to be overloaded. Uh, it's not an STL algorithm because it doesn't work on a pair on a on a on an abstract range. It works on a concrete container. So it has one mm -hmm. standard erase for vector, one for deck, one for list, one for forward list, and so on. Um, and um, because it knows the container, it can remove the elements, uh, erase the elements directly. And because of that, um, you get this remace, re erase remove idiom encapsulated in a function, and therefore you're not exposed to move from objects anymore. There's another question that popped up in the middle from someone. I saw the remove erase idiom is not needed with erase if. Correct. Um, the erase if um, functions are generalization. So for sequence containers, you would use um, um, erase remove. And for node based containers, list, um, unordered map, standard map, you would iterate through the um, container and uh, call it equals erase it. Um, to erase individual nodes. You can do the same thing with a sequence container, but that would be quadratic um, because you shift elements, the whole tail of the of the vector, you shift each time for each element removed. Um, and that is something that standard remove or standard remove if optimized for. Um, so um, one goal of uh, introducing this uniform container erasure, uh, standard erase, standard erase if, was to make it uniform over all the containers. So you don't need to know whether you're erasing from a vector or, or, or a hash map. Um, but uh, the fallout of this is that it also encapsulates this dangerous, if you want, um, uh, partially formed state. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This is, um, I don't think that it was a design goal of the proposal which added this, um, but it's a, it's a consequence of doing this this way. All right. Yeah? OK, then let's continue. Thanks. So here we are. So um, now let's talk a bit about uh, partially formed states and exception guarantees. So There's very little because there's not much to say about this. So if you remember, um, when the standard um, reduced uh, exceptions, nobody knew how to write exception-safe code until um, Dave Abrahams came up with uh, the definition. Um, uh, um, of different exception guarantees. And uh, those were basic, strong, and no throw. No throw is simple. You, the operation that you're calling does not throw any exceptions, so it always succeeds. Um, strong means it has transactional, transactional semantics. So either it, su it succeeds or 
if it fails, it has not changed the objects that participate in the operation. For example, standard vector uh, pushback has strong um, exception guarantees. Um, either you push the element on the vector or the vector is unchanged. Um, if an exception is thrown, for example, we cannot allocate memory. Um, and then there's basic. Um, and um, I always thought that it's um, don't leak memory, but otherwise don't assume too much. Uh, it turns out if you actually read the paper um, from Abrams, uh, it's on boost.org somewhere. Um, it means that um, all the classes involved have uh, still all their preconditions hold. And now if you think about how what this means for, um, for um, an, a world in which moves are a possibility, if you move away from an object, it's no longer, in general, it's no longer um, has all its preconditions. Or I should not say it has all its preconditions. It says um, it's in a state in which all, in which you can call all functions that don't have preconditions. This is what valid and unspecified means. So the basic, um, um, the basic exception guarantee in other words than the standard, um, but with the same intention, says uh, basically all the objects are in a valid but unspecified state, uh, which is equivalent to saying that you can call any member function on them that does not have an explicit precondition. Yeah? So for example, standard vector size doesn't have a precondition, so you can call it on any such object. Whereas we have seen if you um, take flat map, for example, you can no longer call size on a move from object because you would need to do extra work than to just member-wise move away from the objects uh, that make up the key and the value store to actually get a consistent view of the size again. So basic um, means um, not all pre preconditions hold. I should fix that, but that um, um, all the element, all the all the objects are valid but unspecified, and something. Uh, some, including me, think that uh, this is too strong and that there needs to be a weak uh, exception guarantee, which basically means, yeah, you don't leak any resources, but the objects are partially formed and no longer um, valid. Yeah. The, if you analyze this more, then you will find that the only difference between weak and basic exception guarantees is that uh, is how the documentation of the classes in question are written. Because as the class author, I can always say, if you have a move from object, you cannot um, call size on it. And there's nothing that tells otherwise that I need to make this, um, that I need to make this um, uh, work. I can always say, this function does not work on a move from object. Or the default constructor and the um, and the source of a moved uh, and, and the moved from object of this class are partially formed, and the only valid uh, operations are assignment of a new value and destruction of the object. And then I have an implicit, um, um, if you will, an implicit um, invariant uh, um, um, precondition on every other function except those mentioned, the destructor and the assignment operators. So it's really nitpicking in a way. And um, where it stops nitpicking, we will see um, when we get to standard movable in C++20. But at a higher level, um, this, this war between a partially formed uh, state and valid but unspecified is just, uh, uh, it's just nothing because as a class author, I can always write my preconditions and nobody tells uh, the clients of, of the class um, what the preconditions are un unless they read the documentation. So um, a definition like can call any function which doesn't have a precondition does not give much information unless you say what functions specifically you require not to have preconditions. And this is what the standard does not do. And when it now started to do this in C++20, which we will talk in a second, I got it wrong, unfortunately. So, um, but yeah, so the difference between weak and basic is basically just the documentation. What do I make? Do I make size which everyone assumes to have 
no precondition. Do I make that have a precondition that it's not called on a move from state? Right. And again, um, this shows the power of the partially formed state because I can always assume, it's always safe to assume that default constructed and moved from objects are partially formed and those which um, now also those which um, t partook in a failed um, operation. Um, and uh, the only thing that I know what to do with them is assign a new value or destroy. That always works. If I no want to know more, then I need to look at the documentation of the class. And um, this is the nice thing about the partially formed state mental model is that it works everywhere and always. And um, if I code to this mental model, um, then I can review code for correctness without knowing which type this is and um, what this type actually guarantees. Yeah. This is the nice thing about partially formedness. So let's have a look at what um, C++ 20 changes. So the standards always said since um, C++ 11 that moved from objects are placed in a valid but unspecified state. In C++17, this was promised uh, for standard types. It did not say anything about user types. And C++20 now suddenly seems to require this for user types too. If you look at the de definition of the standard movable concept, you will see that it is composed of standard swappable, standard um, default constructible something, and move constructible. And in move constructible, um, the move constructible um, concept requires in prose, not in a computer readable form, but in, in standardese and in legalese, that RV, which is the moved from object, resulting state is valid but unspecified. So this seems to require you to write every movable type that the standard concept movable, considers movable, um, to have valid but unspecified moved from state. And um, this is not so. It's a bug in the standard. You can completely ignore that C++20 clause. It will be fixed. Um, Wille, uh, Herb, Geoffrey, and some others are on it. I have not looked um, um, at the progress of, of this. Um, but it was, uh, this was um, Geoffrey showed his uh, paper with indirect int in, in Prague in March, uh, in, in February. And um, uh, a group was formed from um, the committee to, to investigate and to, to fix this because it was considered to be a bug. Um, no implementation can depend on this. Um, everyone would be on their, um, on, on the keyboards writing bug reports to the standard library implementers if uh, any implementation would actually enforce this. They can't, they can't because it's not computer readable. Um, it's in the documentation, as I said, much more than in the code. Um, but um, even if it was th theoretically possible, any implementation which would require this would be, um, would get bug reports. So it's a quality of implementation issue to not require this. Um, so you can completely ignore this fuss about that. What we cannot ignore is, an, um, and that brings us to an extension of the partially formed de definition from the EOP. And uh, the problem with the elements of programming book is that it's um, already pretty old. It's uh, from 2009 and it uses a subset of C++ or um, superset in some sense even that knows about concepts. Um, but it does not know about move semantics. Um, so a swap in elements of programming works in terms of copies, just like C++ 98 standard swap did. Copy to temp and so on. Three copies instead of three moves. So it never comes into the situation that it needs to deal with the partially formed state or, or moved from state. It needs not define um, the moved from state because moves don't exist in its language. But standard movable requires standard swappable. And um, since we know that standard swap implements um, move assignments, uh, move swapping by three moves, uh, 
um, that makes sense that if you have something movable, it should also be swappable because um, if you think about it, um, swap is kind of the C++ 98 way of, of, uh, of moving, right? If you wanted um, to, uh, to move something into a standard vector um, in C++ 98, you would resize the vector to, to one larger and then swap back um, the vector back with the element that you want to move in. And that will be faster in copying it in, for example, large string or something like that. And um, so in a sense, standard swap is the C++ 98 version of moving. And so it makes sense that is something that is um, supposed to be movable is also swappable. Um, a problem occurs when you swap a variable with itself, um, which um, you should avoid, but sometimes it's um, very hard to and um, not really needed um, because for built-in types, we expect the standard swap to swap um, the same object on top of it uh, on top of itself without problems. Um, but if you look at what this means for the implementation that standard swap now has in C++ 11 and following, um, you see that um, so assuming that uh, left hand side and right hand side are aliases for x because we're calling swap xx, we first move um, the content of LHS to the temp variable. Then we move the content of RHS to LHS. LHS is moved from, but assigning to a move from a variable is okay. But because um, LHS and RHS alias each other, um, we are moving onto an object that is moved from, but also from an object that is moved on. RHS is the same as LHS. Yeah? So we move a sign from a moved from object. And this is not covered by the C++, uh, by the EOP definition of moved from because uh, of um, partially formed state. Because there we can assign to a partially formed object and destroy it, but we cannot assign from it. That would be an error. And in fact, we will see later um, that um, we can and should probably uh, prevent a partially formed objects to appear on the right-hand side of a of a copy assignment, because that is a bug. But here we see um, that in a move assignment, if you want to use standard swap, um, the, we come into the situation that we move a sign of move from object onto itself. So how to fix, um, what is the solution for this? There are two solutions. Um, we want our type not necessarily to be um, standard swappable. We want it to be swappable. Right? So, um, well, one solution is to make it move. Uh, it make its move assignment self assign safe. Yep, that is one solution, and that is often um, easy. For example, if you use the move and swap idiom variant of the copy and swap idiom, um, that is uh, trivially fulfilled. Um, the same reason why copy and swap is um, move self assignment safe, because it, it uses a separate temporary object to move the state into, or uh, you can provide a swap overload found by uh, um, argument dependent lookup, and that then needs to be self swap slave. Um, none of these typically cost performance. Um, I have not seen a case where this would require additional checks. Um, but even so, if you're a library implementer that uses swaps, you should probably try to avoid swap swaps. Um, this is again a quality of implementation issue. Um, the major standard libraries uh, try to avoid self swaps um, because they need to deal with um, user defined swap functions that are probably not self assigned safe. Um, so, this is a quality of implement implementation issue again. Um, but as a class author, you should um, just make sure that either your move assignment is self assigned safe or that you provide a swap functions, which is self-swap safe. And I call this uh, the Howard Hinnant uh, uh, extension. He probably doesn't like it because he doesn't like partially formed state in general. Um, but um, he brought this up that this was required on top of the um, definition of an EOP, which reads that an object is in a partially formed state if it can be assigned to and destroyed. And we need to fix that up for C++11 where move semantics entered 
um, an object is in the partially formed state if it can be assigned to, swap, swapped, or destroyed. Yeah. Questions to this so far? Um, yes, there's a question for slide 48. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, exception guarantees. Um, maybe the slide number is wrong, but it talks about the exception guarantees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mentioned that this is wrong. Um, it's written wrong. Um, not all preconditions hold. It means that uh, all the class invariants hold, which is equivalent to saying that um, you can call any function which does not have preconditions. So okay, yeah, so the slide is wrong. <laughs> So on the, the Wikipedia article is uh, the same notion that is represented in yeah. when people usually talk about exception guarantees, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, this uh, Wikipedia, basically, there is only one definition, which is the one from David Abrams. Um, there is um, on a boost con some 10 years ago, someone um, proposed this week, um, week, um, week exception guarantee. Um, but uh, there was no outcome after this, um, as far as I can tell. And um, yeah, so uh, these are the ones from uh, David Abrahams. Uh, I don't know whether Java stuff like that has, has different ones. These are the ones from C++. And mm -hmm. um, Wikipedia just um, takes those from Dave Abrahams paper. And yeah, otherwise it's just a bug on the slide. Excellent, okay. So now that we have talked about um, two models um, already, uh, you might not have uh, recognized it, but we have already talked about two move semantic models. Um, the one is standard move plus a valid but unspecified state. And the other one is standard move plus partially formed state. And you can ask a question, are there others? Um, hopefully weaker ones where you don't need to pay so much or you don't need to um, pay so much attention um, to all these details. Um, and I don't need to give talks like this. And yes, there are. Um, so the first two we have talked about. And the third one is from um, Peter Dimov, I believe. Uh, it's uh, from PO308, um, which reduces uh, partially formedness to basically destroy only. So instead of assigning a new value or destroying the object, all you can do with a pilfered object is to destroy it. Um, the paper contains an, an implementation of standard list uh, where this actually makes a different a difference where a partially formed um, is um, is noticeably slower because the default constructed um, standard list needs to have um, a sentinel node allocated so the default constructor of certain standard list um, implementations needs to allocate a node um, on the heap and um, so standard pilfer would avoid that. So it could just steal the node out of the move from object. And since the, the move from object is no longer assignable, only destructible, it could just null the pointer out and the destructor would know what to do. And of course, there's a destructive move where if you move away from an object, the lifetime of the source has automatically ended. And um, it's interesting to note that um, the last three, so move plus partially formed, pilfered and uh, destructive move, they are composable, right? Um, we have already proven how um, destroying is composable, so destructible. Um, if, um, if a struct is destructible, so are the members. And when all the members are destructible, so is the struct. Uh, so pilfering is also composable in the sense uh, that partially formed objects are. And destructive move, of course, too, because once you move away, you have the valid object on, on, on the target object and the source object is no longer there. So we don't need to talk about the state of it because the state does not exist anymore. And it's only standard move and valid but unspecified, which has the problem that it's not composable. Yeah. 
Another thing, uh, another way to look at this is um, my last guideline is uh, move semantics, violate, don't pay for what you don't use, just like RTTI and exceptions do. Because you can hand write code which is faster. And um, many people do this. So every time you use reallocate instead of malloc and copying over, you're using the fact that uh, reallocate um, is, is faster than an, um, a new malloc and the, and the delete or free of the old block. Um, the EASTL has um, a type trait called uh, is trivially relocatable, um, which basically enables the um, standard reallocate optimization for vector reallocation. And Q vector has the same thing where you can say Q declare type info, type Q movable type, and then Q vector and um, Q list uh, will use um, realloc to reallocate the memory instead of um, allocating, move constructing, or even copy constructing from the old buffer to the new buffer and then destroying the old buffer. Um, so if you understand, don't pay for what you don't use. And uh, the other part, of course, is in C++ that uh, you don't leave uh, space for a more efficient language below C++, except assembler. Uh, then we have just seen that um, um, move semantics as currently specified, um, violate, don't pay for what you don't use. But nonetheless, the partially formed state are the natural states in the move semantics model that we have, which is standard move. And therefore, uh, we need to know about this because this is, after all, C++ uh, uh, 98, C++ period. And uh, the CPB core guidelines in P9, I believe, say um, don't waste time and space. Um, this is C++ period. Um, so uh, if you don't embrace and implement your, uh, your types uh, following the partially formed state mental model, you're wasting either time or space. And this is not C++, um, according, at least not according to the uh, C++ core guidelines. This is not me saying it, although I agree to it. So um, let's put it all together now. So I told you that uh, I came about uh, this move from state uh, fiasco in um, in my attempts to add move semantics to the Qt container to the Qt um, types, and most of the Qt types, are, unless they are three ints or four ints or something like that, um, they are implicitly shared. That means they use the pimple gem pointer to implementation body handle shares or kit whatever you want to call it, D pointer it's called in KDE and in Qt and um, to keep all the state external to the object and the object itself just as a pointer to that and uh, then it shares the state like a share like um, boost intrusive pointer or a, or a shared pointer um, and only when you write into an object if you if you modify the object it would detach um, from the shared state that means it takes a private copy that it can modify because it uh, has exclusive ownership on this so copy and write, whatever these things are called. And what I want to hear, uh, I want to do here um, as on the last two, three slides is uh, to show an implementation of a class which embraces the partially formed state to be maximally efficient. And I want to point out uh, in certain aspects where uh, existing libraries, hello cute, um, deviate from, from this and how this hurts. Yeah, so uh, we already quite over time, but I have given, was given 90 minutes before it shut down, so <laughs> let's go. So um, don't be overwhelmed. Uh, this is just the H file and the CPP file, CPP file um, beside each other. I will walk you through this. So um, the pimple pattern calls for a pointer to a private implementation up here, um, struct private forward declared. Um, and so the whole class exists uh, only to wrap this, paint, uh, this pointer. Yeah. The default constructor just sets the pointer to null. Yeah. This has the advantage just to point that the default constructor doesn't do too much. So the default constructor only needs to establish a partially formed state. That means something that is assignable and destructible. Um, delete of uh, of a null pointer is a no op, and if you assign something over it, okay, okay, the assignment operator needs to take care that it does not trample over, over or does not trip over the null pointer d. But other than that, um, everything is peachy. We have reached a partially formed state, 
um, we need to null out the D pointer, otherwise delete does not, uh, cannot distinguish between a valid pointer that it needs to delete and an invalid one that it does not need to be delete. Um, so this is the minimum implementation that we need to do to reach the partially formed state. And uh, the advantage is, uh, since we don't allocate something here, it can be no except, it can be const expert. Of course, this is not a literal type, but um, if a type um, has a const expert constructor, that means that um, the compiler is free to make um, static initialization into, into constant initialization. It does not need to have, um, it doesn't need to make uh, dynamic initialization, which is kind of good if you have uh, types of this as static objects. You don't get into, um, into the static um, initialization order fiasco. So, and this is inline. It's just setting a opaque pointer type to null that is permissible to do inline code. We do not violate um, the encapsulation of the class here. Um, the private stays private. Um, all we do is null out the D pointer. Uh, the copy constructor cannot be um, inline uh, because it needs to um, manipulate objects within the uh, within the private object, um, but uh, let me undo this. Um, but the move constructor can be, because that one too just steals the um, the other's D pointer, the other state, and um, sets the other's D pointer to null. So I could have written null pointer here instead of brace open brace close, but then I would run out of space. So you can say standard exchange other D comma null pointer. Um, and that means I basically put uh, the moved from objects in a default constructed state. How much simpler can it be? We can document that the move constructed, uh, move, um, moved from state is the default constructed state. Okay, it's partially formed, but um, it's the same state after all. Very easy to remember. The copy constructor, uh, the copy assignment con uh, operator can be in line. Um, you would typically make it out of line. Um, uh, as an optimization um, that you don't need to call into the library code twice, but you can use the copy and swap idiom um, to, um, uh, to, to inline this without breaking the encapsulation. Uh, because this is now uh, implemented in terms of the copy constructor, swap, which is inline, um, and the destructor, which is outline. Yeah, so this can be inline. Um, the move assignment operator, um, can and should be in line so that the compiler sees that you're not actually doing something. And uh, it call you can either use the move and swap idiom, which is like the copy and swap idiom, except for the copy constructor, you call the move constructor. Um, this I would use when you hold uh, expensive resources, either a huge amount of memory or uh, operating resources like file handles and um, locks and stuff like that, because this way of doing things um, ensures that the move, uh, that the state that this uh, object, the assigned to object had prior to assignment is reliably gone because uh, we swap it into the temporary pen object, um, which is then deleted before a return from the function. And therefore, my old state has reliably gone, um, which is important if if, it, if I'm holding lots of resources. If I'm only holding a limited amount of memory, um, then I can do something faster. I can just swap my state with um, the right-hand side's object, assuming that since I'm, um, I'm in the move constructor, I'm only binding to um, R values, which uh, where the next step is anyway, that at the end of the full expression, they are being deleted. So I just swap my stuff out into the into the temporary object for it to delete it for me. Um, so this is uh, much more efficient, but um, it can cause uh, my state to stay along, uh, to stay around longer than anticipated in the presence of standard move, for example. Um, so this is only advisable if all you're holding is actual only memory, all right? So um, the pen destructor needs to be out of line because again, it needs to um, operate on the state of uh, of members of, of the private class. Swap um, should be no except and um, just uh, swaps the pointers. 
I'm using standard ranges swap here to not say using standard swap semicolon swap of the other D uh, because standard ranges swap does that for me now in C20. And um, so this is used, of course, in the implementation of the assignment operators. Um, but I also make this available by overloading um, standard swap um, in an ADL well. This way, this is uh, called, uh, this way of doing it is called uh, hidden friend um, that um, has the advantage that if I, uh, if I do it this way, then um, I get uh, this function as a candidate in an error message only if an actual pen object is, is being involved. Otherwise, uh, the compiler would um, show me all the hundreds uh, of different swap overloads uh, for all the functions that are in scope. Um, and then we have this dechatch function, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Turning to the implementation, we have this uh, private class here on the right side now, and it contains some form of uh, standard atomic int ref count. Uh, so atomic by itself is not usable for this because it's not copyable. So you need to have a small, uh, small class that wraps the atomic and on copy sets the new uh, copies ref uh, ref uh, count to zero. Um, but I saved uh, you the trouble of showing this. Um, the copy constructor just copies the uh, D pointer over and um, then ups the ref count. This is the implicit sharing. Uh, instead of making a deep copy, we do a shallow copy. We just copy the pointer and up the ref count. And um, since we are reaching into the ref count, uh, into the private object here, um, we do reference it. We assert that uh, D is not null. So we have hereby forbidden users from copying from moved from states yeah, or default constructed states. We don't allow copying from partially formed objects. And this is okay because partially formed uh, does not call for these objects to be copied from, only assigned to. Yeah. The destructor um, checks that D is uh, not null. It needs to do this because as you remember, a partially formed objects need to be destructible. So the destructor is one of the few functions that needs to be able to deal with the partially formed state. It does this by checking D before it goes in and dereferences um, the object. And if the ref count falls to zero, it deletes the object. Yeah. So uh, that leaves detach. Detach job is to um, given a pen object um, that may have shared state. Um, detach job is to create a pen object that has unique ownership of its state so it can be modified. Um, if you have two copies of pens and you modify the color of, of, of the copy of the pen, you don't expect the col color of the original pen to change. So this is why detaching is necessary. This is the copy on write part of the whole thing. And the question is what to do here. In fact, do we support detaching from the partial formed state? And my answer is no. Um, because again, in the implementation, we need to reach into the private class uh, to see whether the ref count is, is one. If the ref count is one, we already are the unique owner the exclusive owner, so we don't need to do anything. Only if uh, we're not the unique owner, um, we need to make a copy for us. Yeah, And both um, the referencing, the reference count check and the copy constructor call here, they dereference D. So it's natural to assert that um, we are not detaching from a partially formed state. That said, um, if your class is container-like, which pen isn't. But if your class is container-like, it has a natural empty state. And that natural empty state is often encodable by having a null pointer there. In those cases, it is advisable to have detaching, if you want to have a container that's copy and write, um, to have uh, detaching uh, detached from null pointer too. Yeah. But only in those cases, otherwise we assert. So this is the SMFs, the um, special member functions. And um, the last slide is on the, dom the domain members. Uh, so here we look at color and set color and um, a so-called named constructor. Um, 
I like named constructors because um, if you have a normal constructor call, you always have the same name. You have the class name as disti to distinguish. Uh, you can see that in um, in uh, the in the standard, they use tags to disambiguate. Um, for example, you have an in place t or a piecewise construct t. Um, this is basically so trying to solve the same problem that you have only one name for uh, um, for uh, many number of functions that you might want to write um, for for a type. And um, for example, if you have a standard complex, you might want to construct one from from Cartesian coordinates, or you might want to construct one from polar coordinates. And the standard does not give you that um, possibility. Um, and so these named constructors are very useful because you can give them names. So um, here we construct a solid pen that is not a dashed or so, a solid line, and we give it a color and a thickness, and it returns us a pen that has these properties. And these named constructors now are the um, replacement for default constructed types. Because if you look at QPen uh, in Qt, uh, default constructed QPen has a value. It has um, one pixel wide black solid cosmetic pen, whatever that is. So it has a state and it needs to allocate for the, uh, memory for that state to be uh, in existence. And um, when you see a default constructed pen, you don't know whether the, the author of the code wants to assign something later and just uh, in one of the if cases, he does not do that and that's a bug. Or if he intends to use the default value of the pen object that QPen guarantees to have. If you have this pen that I'm writing, a default the use of a default constructed pen object is always an error. So it's actually easier to reason about such a pen than the cube pen, in my mind. So uh, we also have a getter and a setter. And uh, we extend our private um, with a color and a thickness. And um, the, the named constructor doesn't do anything fancy. It just creates a result that has a null putter. But we plant a new private into the null putter um, and then return this then return the result. Um, and the color accessor um, returns, of course, the color. But again, this is a function that is not assignment and it's not destruction, so it's not allowed on partially formed objects. So I can assert that D is, un, is not null putter here. Uh, and that's perfectly OK. Um, it would even be perfectly OK if I was not so nice uh, to assert on it and just crash on it. That would also be okay, because in my documentation somewhere, I will write that um, default constructed pens and moved from pens are in a partially formed state and that the only valid operations uh, on these are assignment of a new value and destruction, right? So um, this is a nice addition for, for users of the class. And in set color, um, so we want to change the color. So we first need to detach from the shared state, if any, and then we can set the color. And both detach and the setting of the color need to uh, have a non-null deputer. So this uh, will basically assert in detach if I'm trying to call set color on a um, on a moved from object. You may think that this is a bit out of line. That uh, setting a color on a on a moved from pen should be allowed, and that it should automatically set some default th thickness and some join style and dash pattern and what so. Um, if you have these named constructors, there's not really a need to have these setters for individual objects, uh, for individual properties of the pen. Qt is very fond of this property-based uh, API, but in, in small value classes, um, it hurts more. Then, then it helps because for each of these individual setters, you need to have a detach. You need to have um, um, you need to have a valid object to start with. And if you just uh, create valid objects only with named constructors, then um, you can uh, you can basically not either not give those set color um, functions or 
assume that they already have a def uh, defined color um, uh, that are not moved from. Yeah, and uh, with this, I thank you and uh, ask for a final round of questions. I'm not, no seeing, questions. I'm not seeing any more questions, but there will yeah. be an after talk chat. Um, I personally have some, some questions I think I want to ask. Um, so let's see all of you there. The link will be in chat. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll try to get into the.